So clap a lot because because uh, 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 apparently I'm making decisions on who's presenting on uh, on Thursday. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, I, I'll answer any question you want to put up about uh, being my being an entrepreneur for 12 years or my being an angel investor for 32 years uh, or uh, anything that's related to that uh, because this is for you, not for me. Uh, and if you, uh, in fact, don't ask any questions and I'm not having any fun. So, uh, so please ask some questions uh, when we get to uh, that point. I'm, I'm going to run through what I think uh, you want to hear. Uh, if it's not what you want to hear, we'll rush along through and get to what you do want to hear. So here's sort of what I'm going to talk about, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about the angel process. And I am in my, my view of pitching may be a little different than your coach's views of uh, pitching might be. And that's okay because there's no standard one way to pitch. There's no uh, one template fits all. Um, it's about uh, you and your business. Um, let me first of all start off by talking a little bit about uh, lifestyle versus high impact businesses. Um, angel investors and venture capitalists fund companies that will grow, will grow a lot. Um, maybe the potential for uh, 15, 20 million dollars in revenues in five to eight years or more. Um, lifestyle entrepreneurs and lifestyle companies uh, don't, don't grow quite so fast generally, um, but that doesn't mean they're bad businesses or that they don't create jobs or they don't make great jobs for entrepreneurs. Uh, it's just that we are investors so we're looking to put money in startup companies, uh, help you grow your company, and then exit the company when you exit the company. And we're almost always interested in a, a trade sale to a big corporate um, and selling our shares in the company when you sell your shares in the company. Um, so this is a, a bit about the lifestyle, uh, about the capital uh, what I call the capital food chain or capital sources that are available for entrepreneurs. So at the beginning, it's all about you and your resources and you have to be all in. Fully committed, uh, all your resources committed to this business uh, before you'll find uh, uh, other investors who are interested in your venture. So back at the proof of concept stage, it's all about you. Um, during the pre-seed stage, when you're developing a prototype, but before you've approached customers, generally capital sources are friends and family and some government sources. When you first get some contacts with customers and can get some customer validation, that's normally when angels will first invest. Why? Because they want to talk to customers. They want to make sure the dogs will eat the dog food. They want to make sure what you have is a must-have, not a nice-to-have. So we can only learn that by talking to the dogs or talking to the customers. So this is sort of the same point that we angels become invested. It's sort of the seed and startup stage. It's uh, when you've got a product that you can at least beta test uh, or a prototype that you can show to your customers. Um, there are seed VCs that invest at the same time we do. But most traditional venture capital invests uh, when you've got revenues and you're beginning to grow out of the sort of valley of death, um, when you have a, uh, when, you, when your need for cash is primarily growth, that's when traditional venture capital will fund your company. Now, I've invested in uh, 52 or 54 companies and about half of them went like this end. Never got to positive cash flow uh, and I lost most of my money. So look either side of you and those guys probably won't make it. Uh, it's a, a pretty, uh, actually a pretty unusual company that not only survives and grows but makes a great return on investment for the entrepreneurs and for the investors. 
So uh, that's the kind of companies that we're uh, hoping to invest in. And frankly, our track record as angels and VCs is pretty poor. Um, uh, 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 roughly half of the companies that I've invested in have gone belly up, and only about one in ten gives me a great return. A great return being something like 20 times my money. Now, why would a greedy bastard like me need to have 20 times my money uh, if I'm investing in startup companies? It's because the failure rate is so high that if I want to have any kind of uh, upside positive, I need to have a few home runs uh, to make up for, for all the rest of the companies. So if I make 10 investments, nine of them won't give me the capital back from all 10. Oh, so let's say I make 10 1x investments, pick X, 100,000, 10,000, a million. If I make 10 1x investments and I get a 5x back from one company, well, that's a great exit for that company, but I only got half my money back from 10 investments. So out of nine out of 10 investments, the best I can hope for is all of my money back from all the investments I made. And all of my upside is gonna come from one company. So that's why we bet on home runs. That's why we bet on uh, bet the farm. Because we need companies that will uh, explode in growth uh, and, join, and be a great exit for us if we're gonna have any positive a return on an exit. Until we see an exit, a really positive exit in an entrepreneur, we're not investors. We're just donors. We're just, just philanthropy. And that's not why we're in business. We're doing this because we, have, we want to have a positive return on investment. So the capital <coughs> sources and sort of how much money they might be, and uh, excuse me if these are in dollars, not euros, but put a euro sign in where the dollar sign is and we won't be very far off. So friends and family generally invest a few thousand dollars in your company. Uh, government sources may be more than that. Um, but seldom will you find friends and family that will give you more than, than $100,000. Uh, it's usually less than, less than $20,000, seldom over fifty. Angel investors typically invest uh, $150,000 to a million dollars. That's probably U.S. That's in the high side of Finland. Okay, all right. But um, this is pooled. But this is pooled money. This is uh, a money in a round of investment. And um, the I understand that the investment from uh, in Finland may be even a little bit lower than $150,000. Uh, but even in the U.S., you very seldom see angels invest uh, more than a million and a half dollars. Pretty unusual. Um, classic traditional venture capital starts actually at about four million and goes up from that. But you find CV seed VCs all over the world who invest uh, alongside angel investors. Um, a quick comment on our absolutely Finnish perspective. Our average uh, seed investment is around uh, 300k. And typically, that's uh, roughly half, half of the round. So the uh, average uh, round size uh, here in Finland would be uh, half a million to uh, seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, euros. And would you consider that a, a venture capital round? A uh, seed round. A seed, a seed, yeah. a seed round. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So here's uh, how we make decisions on companies. It's not all about products and technologies. It's about management team. Why is it about management team? Well, if you look at the popular press, they will all tell you there's a shortage of capital for startup entrepreneurs. To that I say bullshit. There's no shortage of capital for entrepreneurs, but there's a shortage of entrepreneurs who can execute. And it's not about capital. It's not about product and technology. It's about executing against your business plan. And that's what we're trying to measure. We're trying to measure your ability, first of all, that you have a great plan, and number two, that you have a team uh, that can execute against that plan. And most can't, and that's why most companies fail. When, when a reporter goes and interviews somebody to find out if there's enough capital for entrepreneurs, who does he interview? Somebody who couldn't raise money. Why couldn't they raise money? Well, they raised money last year, they can't raise money this year. Why is that? Because they couldn't execute against a business plan. 
That's, that's who's telling the press we have a shortage of capital for entrepreneurs. So it's all about execution. Um, let's talk about the, the process that most investors use, and not just angels, not just angel groups, but venture capital as well. Organized venture capital sees a bunch of deal flow from lots of different sources. Um, venture capital usually likes to see reference sources, so that somebody referred the deal to them, but they'll look at other deals as well. Angel groups are the same way. Uh, they like they they will look at new deals that are not referenced to them, and they uh, but they will also uh, listen to deals uh, that are uh, come over the transom, as we say, uh, blind blind introductions. Um, we close on about two percent of the deals that we that we that come over the transom. Now, what could happen? <coughs> well. If you come out of an accelerator program and come into ours, that's a highly referenced program, your likelihood of getting funding is substantially higher than if you uh, come into us without, uh, without any previous training or exposure to, to uh, entrepreneurship centers or accelerators or incubators, uh, your chance of success is lower. So uh, there are things that can change this 2% and accelerator programs are one of them. So when the, when the deal comes into the transom, it's usually a one-pager uh, well, with a business plan and a PowerPoint presentation. And we have either some staff or some members who do a pre-screening. What is pre-screening? Well, we're looking against bouncing your plan against our criteria for investment. What are our criteria for investment? Well, angels actually usually put that on their websites, and a lot of most VCs do too. So we don't invest in pornographic websites. So don't submit your pornographic website to, uh, to our angel group. Uh, but some angel groups don't invest in life science. Some only invest in life science. Uh, others like later stage deals. Others, uh, some like uh, seed and startup stage deals. Some won't fund companies have the valuation above, pick a number, $4 million. Um, uh, others uh, uh, have a, will tell you what their range of financing is. I mean, we will finance between, you know, hundred thousand dollars and a million dollars, or some number like that. So most of that information is on the website, and that's what sort of this pre-screening is about. Is this company in our sweet spot? And actually, an intern or a staff member can actually tell that for us. Um, so if you pass that screen and look, only half do. If you pass that screen, then you'll probably get looked at by uh, some or maybe all of the members of the group. Um, if it's, we're talking about a syndicate, and when I use the word angel group, uh, please interpret that as angel syndicate. Um, and we're trying to, at that point in time, decide whether we want to enter due diligence, which is an ex extensive, ex exhaustive study of, of your business plan for investment verification purposes. Both VCs and angels uh, do a lot of due diligence. Um, and it has been proven that the more due diligence we do, the more likelihood we're gonna get a positive return on investment. If we do a lot of due diligence on your company, we're seven times more successful at being success, being having a successful exit than if we do almost no little, no investment on, or no due diligence on the possibility of investing in your company. So we may spend, they may be a team of three, four, five, six people uh, who look at your deal. Um, and uh, we may spend two or three months uh, looking at the deal. If there's one thing that angel investors uh, are probably, let's say, who could probably improve upon, it's our time to make a commitment to entrepreneurs through the due diligence process. <coughs> So why are we slow at due diligence? Well, we're part-time investors. Some guys get paid, actually get paid to make investments, uh, and they invest other people's money. Oh, like a venture capitalist. Uh, but angel investors, we're writing checks from our own, uh, from our own uh, accounts, and we're not getting paid to do this by anybody. Uh, and you know, we like to play golf, and we like to go fishing, and we like to go on uh, cruises, and we like to play with our grandchildren, 
So we're part-time investors, so it may take us a little bit longer to do diligence, but we recognize that we're slow at it, and we're trying to get better at due diligence. So <clears throat> if our due diligence teams likes your deal after they've done an in-depth study, uh, they will probably themselves agree to write a check and tell everybody else in the angel syndicate that this is a really good deal and they ought to uh, consider investing as well. So you may come back and make another presentation to the whole group and then go through some kind of a closing process. Yes, sir? Quick question, if I may. In the case of angel syndicates, who's supposed to bill for due diligence? There is no bill for due diligence. We do it ourselves. Uh, very seldom do we pay money. Uh, let's say you've got some very sophisticated intellectual property and we need to have some validation by a university professor or a, a patent attorney, uh, then we might pay a small fee, and that's negotiable. Uh, we probably wouldn't spend, if we're making $100,000, $150,000 investment, we wouldn't want to spend $50,000 on uh, due diligence. That doesn't leave anything for the investment. So let's say we did do spend $5,000 on uh, due diligence on $150,000 investment. What we probably do is cut a deal with the entrepreneur that said, if we make the investment, it comes out of the capital that we're putting into the deal. If we don't make the investment, we'll pay for it or we'll split it or something. Uh, so that's that part of due diligence, if we pay for any, and usually we don't, but if we do, uh, we'd negotiate on how that's going to, if we don't make the investment, how that's going to be paid for. Any other questions? Would it make sense to have a finished view again on this one? Sure. Have uh, at it. The, from Pim Bear's perspective, sure. maybe. Sure. Uh, so uh, what's the uh, sort of main difference between uh, U.S. and Finland is that the U.S. is uh, sort of uh, angel group driven. Uh, your group maybe has, what, 30 members. Uh, in Finland, we have uh, hardly any groups, but uh, two large network our network of uh, 200 plus and uh, people with uh, what, 120, 130? 150. 150. 50 angels. <laughs> so it's, uh, the dynamics are quite a bit different. Uh, different. Uh, obviously the uh, sort of top line will be, uh, maybe put the previous one back, the uh, top line is more or less the same and the bottom line is uh, more or less the same. But what happens in between is uh, quite different in, in terms that uh, I'd say Finnish angels are uh, nearly as, as organized as uh, the angel groups in the uh, in US. Uh, we are learning and it, it's, uh, it's moving towards uh, you know, more sophisticated, sophisticated uh, practice, but it's, uh, it's by no means Finnish, Finnish angels are uh, acting as, uh, as US angels in, uh, in terms of their uh, investment process. It's more uh, uh, individuals making uh, their decision rather than a group investing. I guess uh, the closest you can get is uh, we have a, if you go to our, our website, uh, there's uh, applying financing from uh, angels. Uh, that's something that is uh, <coughs> not interesting from our, our funds perspective or point of view, uh, other to uh, the uh, industry being uh, something that we uh, turn on and invest in, uh, the round size being uh, too small for us. Uh, there we have a sort of uh, pre-screening group of uh, uh, four angels who actually do the screening. What is what gets uh, presented to the whole network, and uh, in there the uh, uh, go through rate is uh, around 50. Just to give a little bit of company company perspective, we've raised about 600k euros in angel investments. The fastest decision, or let's say handshake, we got from initial contact to handshake was about 24 hours. Highly unlikely, we don't count on it. I think the longest from initial contact to no was about six months. So typically tended to be between about, let's say, a month and a month and a half that we got a commitment from the investor. What I've found interesting about Bill's, Bill's slide, and I think something I would highly recommend for Finnish Angels, is the due diligence. We have 600K ranging from about 40k up to about 150k in one investment, <coughs> and the most due diligence any have, anybody has done so far is two discussions with the management team. So uh, the depth of due diligence, 
I think both for the investor's sake and also I think it would be beneficial for us, should be higher. And I think groups like uh, Fibon, uh, Finvera should really try to work on that and standardize that and give better tools for doing due diligence with uh, so that it gives better protection <coughs> for both parties. I know that Fibon is working on that. Uh, we ob obviously do. Uh, well, you do own, obviously, yeah. Yeah, yeah we do uh, part of the due diligence uh, by our team. But we always uh, use third party to do the uh, legal due diligence. The uh, cost for that is typically uh, two to three uh, thousand euros. And uh, if we end up investing, then the uh, company basically build from the uh, investment. If, if we don't invest, then we pay the toll. The worst I've seen, that was actually VC investment. We raised about three and a half million. We ended up paying 65,000 in legal fees after uh, a horrendous wrangling. Basically, the investor, whom I shall not name, we had agreed on a cap. Three o'clock in the morning, we were just about to sound, oh, by the way, we have this slight problem. We exceeded the cap. You pay for it, otherwise we walk away. And I was, let's say, no start points. We had no choice, so we took the money, but that was rather horrendous. The they, they don't need to come back for more investment from, or more companies <laughs> to invest in your, in your output. Um, and so they burned that bridge. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the primary criteria is management team. Yep. Uh, and what about startups that was bootstrapped by developers? What, like, like our team, we've got three dev and one creative designer that worked for three years for three years as outsourcing company. After that, they decided that we got a nice idea. They already created an app, launched it, uh, but they are not really so experienced in management. So what? So we have some problem with Angel. <laughs> Yeah. So find a partner, uh, help have uh, investors help you find a partner, uh, get some business experience in group. Yeah. Uh, find a team member who knows something about running companies. So while we haven't such guy in the team, our chance is much lower. Why? Well, uh, so yeah, well, for sure. Uh, you, you, just, you said so yourself. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't tell you anything. You already told me the whole story. The good news is a good angel can help you set up <coughs> can help you actually meet other team members. They usually have extensive networks. They can, okay, I like you guys, you need some experience. Why do you talk to this and this guy? And then if you hit it off, I'll invest. That's happened to us for some time and for a few times. And that, that I think can be quite helpful. Okay, okay so let me go through uh, uh, my perspective on business plans and pitching. Um, and let's see, it's 3.10. Uh, so I want to sort of get done with this by 3.30 if I can, uh, simply because I want to spend time with, uh, with the company. Um, there are many people who tell you, oh, you don't need a business plan. Uh, I'll, uh, I like the company, I'll just write you a check. If you believe that, then I've got this nice bridge uh, across the Hudson River in New York City I'd like, to, uh, like you to invest in. Uh, You've got to have a business plan. It's not just for investors. It's for you, and it's for your team. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons for you to write a business plan. Um, it's for clarity of purpose and alignment of everybody's interests. Um, so there are actually these days five forms of a business plan, and you again may already know this, but uh, elevator pitch and a video pitch is a short, uh, present, short verbal or video presentation. Um, and your goal is not to get investment. Your goal is to attract investors. So have them ask for another meeting. Uh, at the end of your video pitch or your elevator pitch, see if you can get to uh, get an executive summary to them. Hand it to them or uh, send it to them uh, by email if they're uh, so interested. Again, your goal of an executive summary is to get another meeting, not to get investment. Nobody's going to write a check based on an executive summary. Oh, one thing about your executive summary. About once... Uh, twice a year, I get an interesting executive summary that I picked up at a networking event from an entrepreneur that doesn't have his contact information on it. <laughs> so how did that happen? Well, he wrote his business plan, then he wrote his executive summary. It's right there in the business plan. So he goes to the business plan to print out some executive summaries and prints them all out because there's no contact information in that part of your business plan and takes them to a meeting and hands them out to everybody. And people say, oh, this is really great. Oh, geez. What was that guy's name again? Oh, well. 
straight in the trash can. So if you don't want that to happen, uh, put your contact information on your executive summary. PowerPoint presentation, we're actually going to talk a lot about pitching and using the PowerPoints in just a minute. Your full plan, you really should view the full plan as a guide to due diligence. This is what uh, the, the investors are going to bounce, your, what we, they learn about your company uh, against your business plan. So it has to be written by you or the entrepreneur, uh, but you can use advisors and counselors and helpers. Uh, but I get phone calls all the time. Where can I have somebody write my business plan? You can't. It's, it's your job. If you can't write a business plan, then I'm sorry, you can't be an entrepreneur. It's pretty easy. If you can't make a great PowerPoint presentation, I'm sorry, you can't be an entrepreneur because you're not going to be able to sell products. You're not going to be able to get investors. You're not going to be able to recruit partners. It's all about the communication skills. So those become uh, pretty important. Um, so first contact, elevator pitch, video pitch, executive summary. Uh, the objective is to get another meeting. Uh, PowerPoint presentation. Now you've got some interested investors in the room. You attracted them with your PowerPoint or with your executive summary or your video pitch or your elevator pitch. So now you're presenting to invest investors. And usually it'll be several people in the room. And the objective is to get them to start the due diligence process. Tell others about it, develop a team uh, to study your, study your business plan and make some kind of a decision as to whether they want to invest in your company. And this can be a pretty intense interaction with investors. Um, the, and I think I've already told you what's on here. Due diligence should take uh, quite a while. Uh, uh, so be patient. Uh, and both the due diligence and the closing are going to take time. Uh, questions about business plans? You want to give me the, uh, give everybody the, the finish perception on, uh, perspective on business plans. Anything different? I guess one, one thing we could <coughs> mention here that we, we had uh, uh, Steve Blank here year, what, about a year ago, I think. And, uh, and his perspective on business, business plans is a little bit different. You might have made acquaintance with that also. So uh, he also, uh, he's, he's, tell us. he's uh, also pro promoting this book. It's called uh, Business uh, Model Generation. It's a very nice book. So instead of writing a full 20-page uh, business plan, he, he has a couple of nine topics or something that you should cover and fill out. And it's a more uh, flexible uh, way of, of keeping up a business plan and still uh, considering all, all the different aspects that should be involved. So it's essentially a template? It's a template. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, I'm Ville, running the Startup Sound Program. and. Uh, and we actually, we operate with, with that model. So most of the teams here that are part of Startup Sauna are very early in, in their product development, their business development. So we see it's much more viable for them to use business model canvas as a tool that is, is uh, that you can adapt new things, you can iterate it, then just you know write a plan, which is basically a static document, uh, and your business will eventually change anyway. So what's Steve's uh, definition of the difference between the plan and this uh, template? It's basically that... that Flexibility? Business. That's one thing, yeah. Okay. It's more iterative. Okay. All right. But um, uh, I think you could still call this what a we're talking plan. about, a business plan. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's still describing your business and where you're going. Um, this may be a little uh, less flexible or there may be a little... Uh, more information required here, but you can you can tell me as we go along. So, um, product or service, you know, what problem do you solve? That's actually what most investors want to know. Uh, what is the customer pain that your product relieves? Uh, this is a this this is uh, the first question most uh, investors will ask you. Um, and also, how do you differentiate your product from the competition? So what's your competitive advantage in the marketplace? Uh, we want to know what skills and experiences you have that's going to uh, help you lead a company. 
uh, and what experience you have in the business sector. Uh, we're also pretty interested in the fact that you're, we're going to try to figure out that, that if you're coachable, so are you interested in investors as advisors or do you just want to go on your own by yourself uh, and uh, do you have integrity? Um, there's no such thing as a little white lie when you're dealing with investors. One little white lie and we're out of here because uh, if, you, if, we, if we suspect that there's something less than the truth, at any point in time, uh, we're going to go pick an investor with integrity because we want to believe the financial statements you give us later on and the milestone reports that you give us. So integrity is a really key issue. Um, we want to know who your advisors are, if you have a board of directors, uh, who they are. Uh, if you don't have a board of directors, as part of the investment process, we're going to help you build a board of directors because that's pretty important to us over the long term. Uh, so what's the size of your opportunity, what are the channels that you're going to use to uh, get to those customers, uh, is branding uh, an issue, uh, should we be discussing pricing. Uh, competitive analysis, we really like for you to be dealing in a, in a big, huge, fractured, uh, low technology uh, marketplace doesn't always happen, but you know, sounds, sounds nice. You want to compete in the same kind of a marketplace that we want you to compete in. Um, uh, it, there are operational issues that we're going to get in, everything from sales cycle to uh, manufacturing that uh, depends on your business as to how much of that detail has to be in your business plan. We're interested in, uh, in some relatively detailed financial statements. Uh, Primarily income statement and cash flow, but sort of balance sheet sort of comes out of that as well. And we especially want to look at your financing requirements over long term. We are really interested in whether you can get to positive cash flow with, let's say, a half a million dollars or you're going to need five million dollars to get where you're going. Because it makes a big difference in uh, how we sort of uh, tee up your company, help you tee up your company for success. Uh, what are your growth plans, milestones, uh, what can you, what can you, how can you increase the valuation of the company between now when we give you a couple of hundred thousand euros and the next round of financing? Uh, because if you can't increase the valuation of the company uh, with the amount of money that we're giving you now, uh, that means that we're going to raise more money later at the same valuation. So we're, we're not particularly interested in that. Uh, so we want to know what milestones you can hit. Um, uh, my suggestions with respect to business plan are find a template and some good advisors. And it sounds like uh, you've, uh, some of you have adopted Steve's uh, 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 template, and that sounds reasonable to me. Um, keep your plan balanced. Don't focus only on products or technology. Uh, that's sort of a killer as far as I'm concerned. I, wanna, I invest in businesses, not in products. So I think most investors feel the same way. Uh, keep it short and sweet if you can. Um, we really uh, like business plans we can get through uh, that are relatively complete but pretty concise at the same time. Um, anything that you can do to, to validate, to get market validation from the outside, um, uh, through Juniper or through uh, surveys of potential customers, that kind of stuff we're really very, very interested in seeing. So don't make these mistakes. Um, I advise you not to take dumb money. And uh, by dumb money, I mean that's every, everybody except smart money. So how do you find it out? Well, ask the investor for who they've invested in before. Get a list of the companies and call the CEOs and find out whether this is dumb money or smart money. Now, why, if they're going to do due diligence on you, why shouldn't you do due diligence on those investors? So uh, talk to uh, the people that they funded and find out if they're, they really helped build that company or not. If they didn't, go talk to somebody else. Um, I think a big mistake that entrepreneurs make is pitching only products and technology. Uh, that's... Um, that's a quick way to turn an investor off, is not to talk about the business, just talk about the product and technology. Understand what your addressable market is. 
Um, I'll give you a ridiculous example. So let's say that you're in the sheepskin seat cover business for automobiles, and you define the market size as $200 billion. That's the size of the automobile market. That's not the size of your addressable target market. You're in the aftermarket replacement uh, seat cover business. So how big is that marketplace? Well, it's surely not $200 billion. Let's say you're in the new batteries for pacemakers business, and you tell me it's a $4 billion opportunity. That's the size of the pacemaker market. That's not the size of the, of the, um, of the battery business for pacemakers. So figure out what your addressable market is um, and uh, talk to your investors about that. Why is that important? If you're trying to build a $100, $100 million business or a $50 million business, and the total addressable market is $75 million, you're not going to get to $50 million because you've got to have two-thirds market share to get there. That's going to take a long time. The competitors, the entrenched competition, are going to fight you over price, and, uh, legitimate excuses, uh, irrational, dirty tricks, they're going to do anything they can to keep you out of the business. So what you're looking for is a company that you can build a $20 million business in a $2 billion marketplace uh, because now you're under the radar. Nobody even knows you're there. So you can build a nice company uh, that if you only have small investors involved who could exit uh, for a $20 million selling price or a $30 million selling price and still be under the radar. Um, don't ballpark uh, revenues. This is another mistake I see. Let's see, we've got a $300 million addressable market, and after uh, 18 months, we are going to have revenues of 1% of the market. You know, I, I wasn't a math major, major, but I can do 1% of 300 million. I don't need anybody to tell me that 3 million is 1% of 300 million. I can do that calculation all myself. So I want to know who you're going to sell to. And how, what they're, what they're, how often they're going to rebuy? Uh, who else you're going to sell to? Uh, what markets are you going to be in? Are there going to be different marketplaces for this product? So build your revenue uh, model from the bottom up, and don't press revenue. Don't press first, um, first mover advantage, unless you really, really think it makes a difference. Anybody remember Alta Vista? How did it work out, first mover advantage work out for them? How about MySpace? Oh, that really worked out great for them, didn't it? So don't press first mover advantage as a competitive advantage, because you're going to get your ass beat. Uh, because third mover advantage and fourth mover advantage actually work better than first mover advantage most, but not all of the time. OK, we're finally getting around to pitching. And it looks like I've got about. 10 minutes left, maybe five minutes left. Okay, so I like the Guy Kawasaki rules. 10 slides, 20 minutes, and a minimum font size for us old farts of 30. Now, there's another reason for bi big font sizes. That means you put fewer words on the slide. It's not about reading your slides. The slides are an outline of what you're talking about. It's an outline for you. So you can glance at your slides once in a while and make sure you're on track, and it's an outline for us. This is what he's supposed to be talking about right now, you know, the size of his market or whatever. So don't put a slide up there with 300 words on it. Uh, we have no interest in reading your uh, slides uh, as you present them. We're interested in seeing whether you've got the skill sets necessary to make a pitch, and that's what pitching is all about. I'm going to go over those 10 slides for you. The cover slide, oh, notice the contact information is on there again. Uh, we would like to reach you, so please do put your contact information on there. And this slide doesn't count as one of your 10. You get 11. You get 11 <laughs> slides in your 10 slide presentation. Uh, market, so what, prob what problem are you solving? So tell us about the problem and the solution that your customers can't live without. Uh, what's your product? What are the features and benefits of your product? You know, how is it unique to your solution? Competitive position. Who else is in this marketplace? Who do you, gotta, who do you have to beat? What are your strengths and weaknesses versus your, uh, your competitors in that marketplace? 
Uh, why would customers buy a product from you? Uh, sales and marketing, how are you going to find those customers? Is it all going to be guerrilla marketing or social media? Or are you actually going to have sales channels uh, and find ways or, or representatives uh, who are going to go out and uh, sell this product? How are you going to service, provide technical support and technical service to uh, those customers <coughs> after you find it? Um, I guess the business strategy, you know, how after you find the, uh, how are you going to find those first customers? Um, how are you going to grow the, grow the business after you find those first customers? What team members do you need? What partnerships are you going to need? What facilities and capital are you going to require to get there? Uh, financial projections, I think we sort of uh, discussed that in the, in the earlier part. Uh, but in, a, in your slide, we're really sort of only looking at your revenue projections for, let's say, the first five years. Again, we don't need size four font and five years of a fully extended income statement. So make it something uh, that is meaningful, what your sales growth and what your cash requirements are going to be, but uh, make it pretty brief so, uh, so we can read it from the back of the room. Uh, how much money do you need? When are you going to need more money? Are you going to need more money? Uh, where's that additional money going to come from? Uh, how, how long is your runway? Are you going to be able to last six months or six years on the amount of cash that we're giving you? What's the relevant background of your management team? Talk about your advisors uh, and your directors. And what milestones can you hit with this funding? Uh, we really want to know uh, what's going to happen, uh, how much value you can create uh, with this money or when, what milestones you can heat, hit with this money. And finally, when I talk about your exit strategy, um, don't tell us you're going to do an IPO on NASDAQ because it's simply not going to happen. Uh, your likely exit is a uh, M&A transaction. So tell us who might want to buy you. What, tell us three or four different business verticals that might be interested in buying your business. Because we're investors. The object of the game is to invest in you and then five years later actually sell the company and you make money and we make money. So who are you going to sell this company to? And why would they buy, buy that company? Why, how are you going to be positioned on their roadmap so they make a make versus buy decision? That means buy you. So we want to know about that exit strategy. So get, get to the meeting on time, dress neatly, uh, you know, ask the host whether you ought to wear a jacket or wear a t-shirt or wear jeans or, or wear a tie. Uh, find out. Don't go and get surprised. And, and maybe how you're dressed right now is perfect, but maybe it's not. So ask the people uh, where you're going as to what the dress might be. But for sure, get there on time. Uh, don't read your slides or necessarily use notes. Be prepared. Practice, practice, practice. Your, your, your audience wants to listen to you. Um, finish your presentation early or no later than on time because there's always, there's always a, a section after your presentation for Q&A. And that's actually where you can shine. Where you can shine is addressing the questions that individual investors have. So it's not just about your presentation. It's about your presentation and your Q&A. And if you talk for 40 minutes in a 20-minute presentation, you're not going to have any time for Q&A. Um, so uh, I think that's the end. Uh, any other questions?